Well, hi there, everybody. Nina Matei here again with another riveting case study. So I picked the uh, massive F5 tornado that hit Natchez, uh, Mississippi in 1840 as my case study. And this tornado uh, started out from the southwest of Natchez, Mississippi shortly before 1 p.m. on May 7th, 1840, moved northeast along the Mississippi River, and it followed the river directly, stripping forests um, and trees and all sorts of things from both of the shores. The vortex then struck the river port of Natchez Landing, located below the bluff from the actual city of Natchez. The Great Natchez Tornado remains the second deadliest American tornado, killing 48 people on land and 269 on the river. It's one of the few tornadoes that actually killed more people than it injured, with 109 people being injured. Before the Twister, Natchez was a huge center for cotton trade and commerce in the early part of the 19th century. Natchez, Mississippi was the first capital for the state. It was a bustling center of commerce and travel as a result of many favorable factors. The city sits on the Mississippi River in the heart of what was at the time a huge cotton producing region. The advent of steamboats and Natchez location and port facilities made the city a logical uh, break of bulk point where cotton was loaded on river transportation bound for New Orleans. That's according to a website I found called the Hazard and Vulnerability Research Institute, which wrote about this particular tornado in uh, 2014. So um, with the early planter elite, um, you know, they built enormous antebellum mansions and estates, and many of them owned estates in Louisiana, but they chose to make their homes on the higher ground on the Mississippi side of the river. Prior to the Civil War, Natchez had more millionaires in the city than any other in the United States, and it was frequented by people like Aaron Burr, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, Zachary Taylor, Ulysses Grant, Jefferson Davis, and Winfield Scott. After the tornado, Natchez did rebuild, but it was never quite the same. So the night before the big tornado, lightning ripped through, heavy clouds dumped more than three inches of rain throughout much of Concordia Parish in Adams County. While plantation dollars dominated the economy, Concordia was still a land made up primarily of small farmers and craftsmen, masons, blacksmiths, laborers, and others who were struggling to make a living, according to Nelson in 2015. On and along the river, between Vitalia and Natchez, activity flourished. There were scores of vessels, steamboats, flatboats, skiffs. They were amassed in great numbers, including many itinerant boatmen who traded everything from furs to whiskey. At noon on May 7th, a thunderstorm sprang up. Of course, there was no National Weather Service, no two-way radios, no telephones or cell phones, really no means of communicating to warn the residents of Natchez and Vidalia of what was on the way. The cooling rain from the thunderstorm drew residents from their covered porches, and some actually walked in the streets despite the rainstorm. Many had been preparing to eat their noon meal, and they were aware of the dangers that any thunderstorm presents, but they were certainly unaware of what was racing up the river towards them. The killer tornado raged for about 30 minutes, and a local account states, We look around and see Natchez, yesterday lovely and cheerful, Natchez today in ruins. Hundreds of our citizens, without a shelter or a pillow. Genius cannot imagine. Poetry itself cannot fill up a picture that would match the ruin and the distress that everywhere meets the eye. So what happened with this particular storm? Well, the windstorm tossed 60-foot flatboats into the river, drowning their crew and passengers. Other boats were picked up and thrown onto land. A piece of a steamboat window was reportedly found 30 miles from the river. Many doing business on shore were also killed. At Natchez Landing, the destruction of dwellings, stores, steamboats, and flatboats was almost complete. It then moved into the town of Natchez, though its full Full width of devastation also included the river and Louisiana village of Adalia across the river. Witnesses reported that the air was black with whirling eddies of walls and roofs, chimneys and huge timbers from distant ruins, all shot through the air as if thrown from a mighty catapult. The central and northern portions of Natchez were slammed by the funnel 
and many buildings were completely destroyed. 48 people were killed on land, 269 were killed on the river. And on the river boats, many were sunk, others were flung ashore, and several caught fire. One river boat, the Ben Sherrod's boiler, overheated, exploded, and caught its load of fuel wood on fire. The rope steering lines caught fire so the captain couldn't steer. Other boats tried to come to its rescue, but they accidentally ran over survivors who were already in the river. Barrels of gunpowder on board the Ben Sherrod finally exploded with a roar that was heard for miles around. Numerous other deaths may have occurred further along the path as the tornado struck rural portions of Concordia Parish in Louisiana as well. The Free Trader and newspaper stated that reports have come in of plantations 20 miles distant in Louisiana and the rage of the tempest was terrible. Hundreds of slaves were killed, dwellings were swept like chaff from their foundations, the forest uprooted, crops beaten down and destroyed. Never, never, never was there such desolation and ruin, according to Stanley in 2004. Interestingly, the number of injuries was 107, which is really a lot lower than most tornadoes for injuries um, compared to fatalities. The damage estimates ranged from a million to five million, which might be 20 to 100 million dollars in today's. Um, uh. So looking at stages one and two of this case study, Valsic and Tracy described a lack of resources and limited ability to quickly alert residents to the dangers of the weather system developing. Our modern ability to alert both residents and responders is far more advanced than it's ever been. All public service agencies and response organizations maintain elaborate early warning systems, including National Weather Service forecasting and modeling software, Florida State Warning Point for reporting incidents and receiving updates on emergency incidents. State agencies like the Department of Health subscribe to EverBridge, which enables the agency and local health departments to alert staff, provide directives, and to um, gather situational awareness. Likewise, social media has expanded our ability to communicate directly with residents to a degree never seen before, but we know there are still gaps. Staff are overloaded with messages and information. Residents receive a continual feed of information, entertainment, and advertising. So making certain that our prevention and preparedness and self-protection messages are heard above all the other media remains a challenge. Valsic and Tracy also discussed the necessity of communication of um, communicating between municipalities affected by or in danger from the tornadoes and with those who may be able to send uh, rescuers and resources. In 1840, the ability to send information instantly was almost non-existent. Our modern technology is backed up with formalized mutual aid agreements between law enforcement, fire service, search and rescue, and emergency management assisting compacts, and then also emergency policies that begin moving resources on our behalf when the situation is severe enough. Our ability to organize the incoming aid and staffing is supported with the incident command system adopted across the nation and the training and exercises which support unified command, common terminology, and standardized, standardized organizations. So in stages three and four of the case study, with the early warning systems and the mass alert programs like Code Red, which can distribute warning messages um, and protective information to the whole population within minutes, Natchez may be able to help its citizens seek shelter from the oncoming tornado. Committing to the construction of strong and accessible tornado shelters across the city and gathering the political will to create and enforce building codes for shelters in public buildings will save lives and reduce injuries as well. In 1840, there was no Red Cross, no National Guard or presidential directives or decrees, no mobilization of doctors and emergency personnel who would fly in from other cities by plane and helicopter to the heart of a disaster and save lives. The townsfolks did the best they could, Nelson said in 2004. On land, we can rely on medical surge plans which help hospitals discharge patients to make room for more severely wounded survivors. The state medical response teams and the disaster medical assistance teams from the federal government 
maintain a network of rapidly deployable personnel and uh, equipment who can decompress overloaded hospitals. The um, National Disaster Medical System can supply staff to backfill hospitals and clinics. And our state's fatality mortuary response system called FEMORS is mirrored by the federal uh, disaster mortuary system called DMORT. On the river, the rescue of injured and the recovery of dead is a combined urban search and rescue operation with local mutual aid and state and if needed federal resources. This technical and dangerous work is coordinated within the discipline and integrates specialized training and equipment. Being a hub of commerce, Natchez needs to clear the river so supplies and resources can be brought in and so commerce can resume to keep the economy moving. Clearing the river of debris is conducted through the Army Corps of Engineers and is supervised by the Coast Guard, which is responsible for maintaining the nation's navigable waterways. Debris removal would um, also include today the shipping companies and the transportation companies as long as and also um, independent contractors would help get that job done. So my takeaways from this case study are pretty much in the area of resources. The number of communications resources at our fingertips keeps expanding with no end in sight. The amount of planning, training, equipping that the nation has accomplished in the last 40 years of incident response and emergency management um, means we've made huge strides in our ability to be prepared and respond. We've also made enormous progress in every area of emergency operations and response. I think that what holds us back still is the overload of information, the competing media messages that can drown out our preparedness and protective messages. And I also think that emergency management's work to change planning and zoning laws helps to ensure more and better uh, storm shelters and construction away from hazard prone areas, which protects our communities by moving people out of harm's way to begin with. And lastly, the level of technical and specialized training and dedicated resource, resources, in this case, river operations, makes response and recovery more thorough and less hazardous. I ended up with quite a few resources for uh, or references for this particular case study, but a lot of them um, refer back to the disaster management systems that are both um, coordinated and maintained at the state and the federal levels. I hope you enjoyed the case study and I hope you have a great day. Thanks so much.